Welcome to Pleasant Green Sunday School. This is Lesson 13 for August the 30th, 2015. We complete Unit 3 today entitled Advocates of Justice for All. Our topic for today taken from the Adult Quarterly is the Change Agent. The Change Agent. Our devotional reading is taken from Psalm 24, verses 4 through 11. Our background scripture, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 through 12. And Matthew chapter uh, 7, verse 12. Our print passage is taken from uh, Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Our key verse reads, Therefore all things, whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Our lesson aims today, number one, is uh, to review Malachi's prophecy about possessions, wealth, and hospitality in light of their faithfulness and justice. Number two, confess personal unfaithfulness to God and pray for forgiveness. And the third aim is to institute a personal plan for charitable living. We have three outlines today that we will be talking about um, from Malachi, the third chapter. The first one is entitled, Two Messengers. The second uh, outline is entitled, Judgment is Coming. And the third outline is entitled, Evidence of Repentance. We thank, thank and praise God for the privilege and the opportunity to share another word with you uh, from our Sunday School lesson. We hope that you have been following along with us as we have uh, completed a, a pretty extensive survey uh, of the, uh, the prophets. Uh, we've covered uh, several of the major prophets as well as the minor prophets. Today we deal with the last book of the Old Testament, uh, the book of Malachi. We have quite a bit to share with you today, but I couldn't help but think about um, the context um, of Scripture, particularly the Old Testament. It's very important, and we're going to share some things as we go along in this passage, that we uh, remain uh, aware of the context uh, uh, of our lessons that we may be able to make um, uh, the correct application. So the biblical context uh, for this lesson is as follows. Amid the backdrop of moral laxity, Malachi was indeed a change aid agent. Writing between uh, 430 and 420 BC, Malachi's prophecy occurred while uh, Nehemiah was still in Babylon. And then our standard, uh, the name Malachi means my messenger. It may be that this is a title rather than a personal name, for essentially the same Hebrew word occurs both in Malachi chapter 1 verse 1 and uh, also Malachi th uh, chapter 3 verse 1. We have little definitive knowledge about this man or his prophetic, prophetic ministry. The issues he addressed seem to parallel those of Ezra and Nehemiah, which would place Malachi in the 5th century B.C., for context, this dating means that the rebuilt temple had been in operation for over a half a century and that most of Malachi's audience had grown up with this institution being fully functional. Malachi addresses a variety of issues, but his core complaint was that the people 
no longer honored or respected the Lord. You can see that in Malachi chapter 1 verse 6a. The worst offenders seem to have been the temple priests themselves who were guilty of using defective animals as sacrifices. Malachi told them that it would be better to shut down the temple than to operate in such a shameful manner. He prophesied terrible judgment for the priests, a curse to span generations. But the future was not entirely bleak for Malachi, and he promised a renewed presence of the Lord. It is the fulfillment of that promise that is especially important for us today. So when you look at the book of Malachi, um, there are six disputations uh, that outlined his book, and there are two appendices. Six disputations. Um, the first one is a dispute about God's love. Uh, the second, a dispute about God's honor and fear. Uh, third, a dispute about faithfulness. Um, four, a dispute about God's justice. Uh, fifth, um, outline is a dispute about repentance. Um, and the sixth is a dispute about speaking against God. The two appendices uh, cover an admonition to remember the law of Moses. And the second one is an announcement of the sending of Elijah. So we're going to get into this lesson today. And, um, you know, as we talk about and have been talking about the Jews, uh, pre-exile, post-exilic Jews, uh, they had quite a bit of trouble with the Lord in terms of their adherence to the law, their adherence to correction, um, God had prophesied uh, through various uh, uh, major and minor prophets uh, that he was not pleased with their, uh, uh, with their conduct. There was a lack of justice, uh, oppression. Um, they essentially uh, failed to keep uh, the laws of God, and it, it made God very angry. Uh, we know that they uh, uh, were taken into captivity, uh, Israel by the Assyrians, Judah by the Babylonians. Uh, but today, as we get into this lesson, uh, the, 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 the prophet Malachi uh, talks about what God is going to do in the future. Uh, after he uh, makes some changes. Um, but we want to keep in mind that uh, the Jews at that time, uh, they accused God of injustice. They accused God of not being fair. Uh, they had many accusations to make about what they were going through. Uh, we even talked about in Ezekiel they had blamed uh, their circumstances on their forefathers. Uh, they failed to take responsibility uh, for their actions. But today, as we look at this lesson, we're going to see some things. And, and I hope that uh, uh, you will write down the scriptures. We're going to give you uh, some Old Testament scriptures, maybe some New Testament scriptures to help understand the context of this lesson. I want you to keep that word in mind because we're going to uh, revisit it later on. So the first outline is entitled Two Messengers. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. The Bible says, Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me and the Lord whom ye seek suddenly come to his temple even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord. So what is Malachi talking about here? Well, the coming Messiah was the speaker in verse 1. In essence, he provided a preview of the events of the Gospels. Uh, 
Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, contained the essence of the first books of the New Testament. John the Baptist was the first messenger in verse 1. He would have the job of preparing the way for Jesus. You can see that in Matthew chapter 3 verse 3 and uh, Matthew chapter 11 verse 10. John the Baptist was a change agent too. Considering his way of preaching, teaching, and dressing, the religious elite of the first century Israel saw John the Baptist as a religious fanatic. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 3 verses 1 through 12. Just as Abraham had prepared the way for the coming uh, nation of Israel by making the radical move from his homeland to the promised land, you can see reference in Genesis chapter 12, John the Baptist would do the same for a new spiritual nation moving from religion that was overridden by tradition and human weakness to a relationship with God empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I want to stop right there. Uh, but you can see here through this prophecy uh, the coming uh, Messiah uh, that Christ would prepare uh, the hearts and minds of, 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 of this new relationship that God wanted. Uh, keep in mind that Israel uh, never, they were never in a position consistently uh, uh, pleasing God. They were always straying off course. And, and, and you can imagine God going back and forth with, with his chosen people. But as we look ahead, God had a plan. He knew where the problem was. The problem was in men's hearts. And so as we look at the Gospels uh, uh, in the New Testament and what Jesus came to do and that was uh, fulfilled, we can get a better uh, understanding of what God is saying here. So speaking in ironic tones, Jesus rebutted the suddenly uh, uh, the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. We may view the phrase come to his temple in two ways. First, we can view it as the baby Jesus presentation in the temple. You can see that in Luke chapter 2, uh, verses 21 through 24, and other occasions throughout his first century, uh, his first earthly ministry, John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. And second, we can view it more broadly as the next step in God's reconciling humankind back to himself. Here the Hebrew word for the Lord literally means master. During his first coming Jesus would be the master of his father's house, the temple, a master teacher and the master of nature. Jesus would be the messenger of the new covenant. This was the new covenant foretold by Jeremiah you can see reference in Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 through 34. Unlike the old covenant written on stone tablets, the new covenant would be written in the hearts of believers because Jesus was both the deliverer of and the new covenant. John chapter 1 verses 1 through, through 3. So we can see here clearly that God had a plan for the hearts and minds of his people. You know, when you, when you look at Israel and you look at how corrupt they were, and, and the law uh, took them only so far. Uh, they were keeping the law. They were not keeping the law. There was nothing consistent about them. They were pleasing the Lord. They were not pleasing the Lord. Uh, they, re they were repenting. They, 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 they fail to repent. Uh, they just had a lot of problems. And we get an, an understanding today about humankind. Uh, we said some weeks back, two things have not changed. God has not changed his mind uh, about what he is going to do in the lives of his, of his people. And, and, and then we have to understand that mankind has not changed. Uh, if, if, if we are not going to accept Christ... 
as our Lord and Savior by faith. As this prophecy looks ahead, it's talking about faith. It's talking about believers. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about being able to have some help with what plagues mankind, which is sin. Uh, sin has always separate, separated us uh, from fellowship with God. It did it in the Old Testament, and it does it, uh, uh, and it will do it in the New Testament. And so, the way that we uh, repair those offenses against God is that uh, the first epistle of John, chapter one, tells us to repent. And God is faithful and just; He will forgive and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. So, this is the target here. As uh, 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 we looked at, at Israel, we looked at Judah, uh, these folk, Israel had, uh, Judah had come out of Babylonian captivity, uh, uh, and they had uh, uh, started the work of rebuilding the temple, and they had various ones that came along and encouraged them. But even after that, they were still falling short of uh, consistency and faithfulness unto God. So, God is looking ahead. God is looking ahead. I want to keep that in mind. So our second outline is entitled, Judgment is Coming. This is taken from uh, Malachi chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. And I want to read this from the NIV translation. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. So I will come near to you for judgment, and I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive aliens of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. Let's look at this a little bit, and we can see about this judgment here. As Malachi outlines uh, uh, what Christ is coming to do. While verse 1 referred to the first coming of Christ, verse 2 referred to his second coming. There is a day of judgment coming. Although his chosen people had mocked God, I want you to look at Malachi chapter 2 verse 17. As not being just, a great day of justice was coming. However, it would not be a good day for those found lacking. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? Some Bible scholars see Malachi's word as a reference to the great tribulation period mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 verse 14. So then endure in verse 2 would refer to withstanding and surviving the great plagues and natural disasters of the judgments described in Revelations chapters 6 through 19. That is why Malachi used descriptions as refiner's fire and launderer's soap. The Levites, or sons of Levi mentioned in verse 3, would be purged or purified so that they would be able to offer to the Lord offerings in righteousness. In that day, these Levites would lead God's chosen people, Judah and Jerusalem, in real worship and sacrifice, not in sacrificial animals, but in the sacrifice of their service and daily living. God's judgment would quickly, would come quickly. Uh, that's in verse 5. God's chosen people were wrong in questioning whether God was just. Rather, God would swiftly punish quick to testify against four groups uh, of people, sorcerers, uh, adulterers, perjurers, and those who practice injustice against others. Those practicing injustice. 
just as we have studied this quarter, the pre- and post-exilic Israel, these people would continue to defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive aliens of justice. To their eternal peril, these immoral and unjust groups will not fear God. So you can see here that God had in mind uh, uh, in the Old Testament as well as we look ahead through Christ to, to, to prepare the way for Christ to come. And we do that through repentance. We ask God to forgive us. And I want you to keep in mind that all unrighteousness is sin. And one of the beautiful parts about this lesson as we look at what Christ would come to do and who would survive and uh, who would make it through uh, the judgment of Christ's coming, it would be those that have accepted him, those have believed and uh, uh, have faith in him and put their trust in him and have uh, been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, it's very important that we understand that God has always punished sin and he always will. Sin must be judged on every level. Sin must be dealt with by God. His righteous nature, uh, his holy nature will not allow him to tolerate sin. So we don't want to, uh, 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 it has, uh, uh, the Jews felt, uh, Israel felt at that time, in the Old Testament time, as we looked at Malachi, you know, they they wouldn't uh, they would not look at themselves in the mirror and see that they were guilty of breaking God's law, uh, but they blame God, uh, and and even today, uh, we seem to take pleasure in unrighteousness, and then when uh, it doesn't work out for us, then we have a tendency to blame God. Uh, we blame God for our sickness and our disease. And some even blame God when folk die. But the wages of sin is death. It has always been a detriment sin has to humankind. And we need to understand this about God. Uh, so he's going to deal with it. Uh, uh, Malachi was prophesying as uh, he looked ahead through the Spirit of God. Uh, uh, revealing things to him and guiding his words. Uh, uh, God is going to punish uh, evil doers. We just need to understand that. Uh, uh, the way that you and I as uh, uh, present day believers, the, we have escaped the wrath of God through Jesus Christ. He is the only sacrifice uh, that is acceptable to God for sin. Uh, he is the propitiation or the atoning sacrifice. He is the mediator uh, between God and man. And so it is his perfect sacrifice, his sinless sacrifice, that we are able to be reconnected to God, uh, 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 to this fellowship that the Lord is looking for. So we want to keep in mind as we look at this lesson, God is dealing with sin, and, and, and you have to appreciate God's efforts here, that he wants a relationship with his people, uh, and he wants his people uh, to be free of sin. Uh, uh, we can't blame God for that. Uh, it's his covenant, uh, uh, it's his sacrifice, uh, it's his heaven, it's his blessing. Uh, everything belongs to God, so he is requiring of his people and I, 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 I know that as we look at this lesson we hear that word chosen people chosen people these are people chosen by God these are people that God have selected but they cannot and refuse to adhere to the terms uh, of what it means to be chosen uh, by God but here Considering that our society is more accepting of immoral activities, what can we do to promote God's way of righteousness? That's a very good question. What can we do? What can the believers do? Uh, 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 what can our preachers do? Uh, what can the saints do uh, to combat what seems to be the norm uh, 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 in the land today? Well, 
Matthew chapter 5 tells us to let our lights so shine that men might see our good works, not evil works. We need to have righteous works, good works, befitting the character of God, befitting the holiness of God. Men need to see that. Men need to witness that, that you and I are holding up the bloodstained banner. Our preachers need to tell uh, uh, God's folk the truth. This is what we mean when we talk about context of, of, of biblical scripture. We need to, re, to, to, to stay in context with what God has said. Uh, uh, you may not understand all of the scriptures. You may not understand the passages. You may not understand why God says a particular thing. But none of us can deny God's character. He has specified that I am the Lord thy God. I am a holy God. He has said that time and time again in the Old and New Testament. If you miss anything else in the Bible, uh, certainly you have seen that God is holy. And what that means is that all of us that, that, that call on the name of the Lord, that say we belong to him, we are responsible for bearing that same image, that same likeness that we were created in. We want to keep that in mind. So we can do a lot uh, uh, if we hold up the standard that God has set forth. Israel, I want you to think about them for a minute. All of these folks that God brought out of uh, uh, captivity, out of Egyptian bondage, and, and then some of them died in the wilderness, and then a, a, a remnant made it over into the promised land. But what was God's objective? For sending them in the Canaanite land. God's objective was that they bear his image. That they live the way that they uh, have been taught. Through the law of Moses. Through the commandments. Uh, so this is not a difficult lesson to understand. But we have to appreciate the fact that. Something has to be done about the sin problem. You know, and as we looked at this, and uh, we're going to get on to our last outline, but, but we don't seem to want to talk about the sin aspect of what's going on around us. Uh, it's offensive to talk about the sin, but that's what's killing us. That's what's hurting us. That's what's keeping us uh, from having the relationship with God that we should have and that God expects and and, and he, you know, God is a jealous God. This is what Joshua told the children of Israel. He said, God is a jealous God. And, and what that means is that he is particular about you. And he is particular about me. He doesn't want to share you with anyone. He doesn't want to share you with any God. So, this is what God is doing here in the Old Testament, even through Malachi. He is ridding uh, 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 society. And this is what we are waiting on today. Uh, we are waiting on Jesus. We are eagerly awaiting our Savior from heaven. You know, I don't care what's going on and who says they're going to fix this and fix that. It'll be nothing like what Jesus will do. You know, and so none of us will be able to stand. You know, and so uh, if we don't have Christ as our centerpiece uh, uh, in our lives, we're going to uh, uh, face a lot of difficulty. You can see that today. Why are we dying? Why are we uh, in all of these different things? Why are we so immoral? Uh, there are no laws against the things that we do. Just everything that we can think of, that's what we do. But God is looking sitting high and looking low and trust me he is going to deal with this aspect of sin uh, and we just need to understand that our last outline is entitled evidence of repentance evidence of repentance what does that word mean to repent does that mean that we we say we sorry God and we continue on uh, doing the things that we do, or we don't change, uh, are we godly sorry? That's what re true repentance takes into account. 
being godly sorry. We know through the word of God. How do we know uh, uh, if we're doing things that don't please God except we examine his word? And then we are godly sorry for our sins and we ask God for forgiveness. You know, I want to say this about Israel. Here's God raising up prophets, sending prophets to them uh, and itemizing what he doesn't like. They were not in the dark about this thing. God was saying specifically what they were doing. There was no justice. The priests were contaminated. They were uh, abusing one another. They were withholding one another's wage. That's an indictment. God was specific about what he wanted them to change. And what he told them was to repent. And do you know they wouldn't do it? Do you know they found that they, they felt like they wasn't doing anything wrong? Isn't that something? God has built this case uh, through his prophets. And, and God has revealed to them that he sees exactly what they're doing. And then they tell God, we didn't do anything. We're not guilty of anything. We're not going to repent. And even as they look around themselves, society got worse. They had enemies coming in and destroying them and uh, taking the temple, destroying the temple, uh, uh, killing them. Uh, don't you think if we have, and I want to fast forward to today, if you look around with all of the things that are going on around us that we know, that we know are a detriment to society, and we look at the Word of God and we see where sin is the cause, why won't we change the behavior? Why won't we stop the sin? Why won't we stop disobeying God so we can live? That, that makes sense to me. But here, Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 through 10, and I want to read this from the NIV translation. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. Verse 9. You are under a curse. The whole nation of you. Because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe. Into the storehouse. That there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. And pour out so much blessing that you will not have room to receive I'm sorry you will not have room enough for it so here God says I haven't changed we said that to you early he's letting the descendants of Jacob know uh, that's the reason why you are not utterly destroyed it's a promise that God had made to Abram it's a, it's a promise that God had made to the children of Israel that they are still alive that they are not destroyed so God goes back into their histories and said ever since the time of your forefathers you have turned away isn't that something to say you have not been consistent you've been turning away from my decrees the things that I command the things that I told you were commandments and laws and statutes and things that I said don't do you did those things. And, and, and it says here you haven't kept them. But look at what God does here. He gives a remedy. He said come back. Come back to me. And I will return to you says the Lord Almighty. But, but you ask how do we come back? That's a very good question. How do we come back to the Lord? How do we restore the fellowship? How do we come back? Uh, and take hold of the promises of God. We simply obey Him. If you're going to read the Bible. 
Let us believe what we read. Let us have faith in the scriptures. If we don't have faith in the gospel, in the, in the word of God, then the Bible is not really helping us. But to benefit the children of Israel here, God is saying, you need to come back to me. So verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how? How do we rob you in tithes and offerings? And I'm going to give you some scriptures. And, you know, as we studied this lesson, uh, we gave you six outlines for this book. And I want to say some things about tithes and offerings. I'm going to give you some scripture because this particular verse has been widely taken out of its context. And as it has widely been used uh, to condemn and offend. And, and I, I, I want you to hear me on this. Because we want to understand something about God. Giving is a beautiful concept. But it's a part of our package uh, of who we are as believers. There's absolutely nothing that you can give God to pay him for the blessings that he bestows upon you. But I want us to understand here that tithes, the word means a tenth. The practice of tithing is mentioned in the accounts of Abraham. I want you to look at Genesis chapter 14 verse 20. And also in, uh, in Jacob. Genesis chapter 28 verse 20, uh, 22. And was codified in the law of Moses. Leviticus chapter 27 verse 30. And also I want you to look at Numbers chapter 18 verse 26. Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse, verses 22 through 29. I also want you to look at Nehemiah chapter 10 verses 36 through 39. And in Nehemiah chapter 13 verses 10 through 13. So when you look at this uh, passage here. And what Malachi is saying here. And how uh, God's people were robbing him. Uh, we will get some perspective of what this verse is all about. And we will understand here that. You know, as we get into the New Testament here and we start talking about uh, giving, I want us to understand something. Legalism, okay, has always been an issue for the church. Legalism. This was a law. This giving that God is talking about here is found in the law. Now, either... The church is going to be about legalism or it's going to be about grace. And while you're looking at those scriptures that I gave you, I want you to look at Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. And you will find that by no works of the law shall a man be justified. There's absolutely nothing you can give God that would prompt him to pay you for what you gave. I don't find that. I find that grace is unmerited. There's absolutely nothing that we can do to earn the salvation. And even the things that God has given us to be a blessing. And I want all of us to understand that we are given these blessings by God. All of this. We brought nothing into the world. And we take nothing out. But God has blessed us to be a blessing but we must also understand who Malachi is talking to here and the basics of this law. So God says here in verse 9, you are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. So he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. So 
you know, we could get into a lot of uh, discussion about giving, but I want us to be careful about legalism. I want us to be careful about that. It was always a threat in the early church. If you look at the whole uh, 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 epistle uh, that Paul wrote to the church at Galatia, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And what happens, uh, uh, there are all sorts of issues that people uh, uh, bring to us and they tell us if we don't do these things, we cannot be saved. If we don't keep these certain uh, principles, we cannot be saved. But I want you to think about your salvation. And I want you to tell me, what did you pay God for giving you that salvation? Let's look at it uh, 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 from a day-to-day -day aspect. God woke us up this morning. What did you pay him for that? How much mercy have you paid God for? And how much grace have you paid him for? So we can see the distinction here in this passage here. But I know that uh, it is used in many applications. And giving is an application that we need to learn and be good stewards over the things that God gives us. But understand this, there's absolutely nothing you can do that God should pay you. Uh, there's nothing you could give to him that he doesn't already own. We want to just bear that in mind. But here God does not change. He does not change in his attitude towards sin. We said that earlier. It is always wrong. He does not change in keeping his promises. He would and will never forget his promise to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, we gave you that earlier. Also, I want you to read Genesis chapter 15. That is why the descendants of Jacob are not destroyed. Yet the time was coming when even God's chosen people would face certain judgment. Those found lacking would suffer the consequences of God's coming judgment. Considering the current moral and religious decline in Israel, God called on his chosen people to return to me. And repent. If they did, God would return to them and bless them. Yet this repentance had had to be shown through more than words. How were they to return? They had to exhibit true repentance in their actions. God asked a rhetorical question: Will a man rob God? Their sinful actions were robbing God so that there would be no mistake in understanding the intent of his message. And in response to the question they asked, God described how Israel had been robbing, robbing, robbing him. They had been depriving God of his tithes and offerings. These tithes and offerings would have been the expressions of their love for God. Since they had uh, not been doing so, the people of Israel were punished, were being punished. They were under a curse. However, God expressed his immense mercy by exhorting Israel to once again bring their tithes and offerings to the temple. God invited them to prove him. If, if they would, God would bless them immensely. See if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall be no room enough to receive it. We must keep in mind that the blessings described in verse 10 were temporal, while the promise of Jesus, the messenger of the covenant, was blessings in eternal life to come. So we want to certainly thank and praise God for the privilege of being able to understand um, what God is saying here about these tithes and these offerings and uh, I want to give you uh, uh, the portions here as we talked about uh, tithes a little bit and I gave you some scriptures. I also want to give you uh, 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 some scriptures concerning these offerings here as it relates to these uh, let this to this lesson. Portions of the animal sacrifices uh, to which the priests uh, were entitled. And you can go back into Exodus chapter 29 verse 27 and verse 28 in Leviticus chapter 9 verse 22.
So we certainly have enjoyed uh, sharing a word with you. We hope that you understand uh, uh, and, and that God will bless your understanding. And we want to be able to go back into uh, uh, our lesson, into the word that we have given you, the scriptures. And we want to be able to, to study these things so we can see that, you know, uh, uh, God was really, really making an effort here um, to get his people back on course. And, and so many times as we look at today, uh, we take God for granted in so many different ways. Finances is just one of those areas. But time, God gives us time. Uh, God gives us opportunity. God gives us benefits. God gives us grace. And he gives us mercy. And sometimes we don't even say, Lord, I thank you. We don't even come back and thank the Lord for the things that he has already done. He is blessing us and blessing us. But he is still requiring us to live a life that is pleasing in his sight. And the children of Israel were not willing to do that. And so as we look at what Christ has come to do, we want to uh, offer Jesus to any of you who don't know him in the pardon of your sins. We want to uh, 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 suggest to you, strongly suggest to you, that you give Christ your life. Call upon the name of the Lord. Try him. Uh, salvation is a beautiful experience. Uh, uh, it's such a, uh, a beautiful deliverance. Uh, of the, the penalty and the power of sin and death and we enjoy the power of the Holy Spirit and that's what keeps us from going back into those things that God has delivered us from. So again we thank and praise God for being able to share another word with you and we want to offer this closing prayer that is offered in our lesson today. Almighty God we express our immense love to you and our tithes and offerings. We know that all that we have is not ours, but yours. We thank you for allowing us an opportunity to be good stewards. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we thank and praise God again. And until such time that the Lord will allow us to sit down and share another word with you, we say God bless you.